Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Mira Blaustein. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Woodstock Film Festival. And um, I am so thrilled to be bringing you this conversation about the film Hunger World, which is an incredibly harrowing and important film that is currently nominated for an Academy Award. You can see the film, if you haven't seen it yet, on Paramount Plus and uh, on Pluto, I think. Uh, but uh, the filmmaker will talk to you a little bit more about it. So now, without further ado, I would like to bring to you Sarah Johnson, who is an amazing uh, producer and executive producer, and who, who will host the conversation with two times Academy Award nominee, Sky Fitzgerald. Sky, if you can join us, please. Hello. Well, hello, both of you, and thank you so much for joining. And um, Sky, I'm leaving you in Sarah's very capable hands. Okay. Thank great. you, Mira. That's great. So Sky, I'm very excited to be here with you. And I rewatched the film again today. Um, it doesn't get any easier to watch, I'll tell you that. Um, but I have a lot of questions. Uh, and I, and I want to start with how does somebody with the name Sky Fitzgerald get access uh, to uh, Yemen? Number one, um, how did you know the language? How did you? How did you kind of? First of all, how did you end up focused there? And mm -hmm. and then kind of just to the logistics of of the of access to the culture. Yeah. So the um, the. the the sort of the motivation really is that this is the third film of a trilogy about global displacement that I've been doing that I started about six years ago. So it's sort of the capstone film for that. And it started as this loose idea of, based on just the foundational knowledge that, you know, 1% of the global population is displaced. Um, it's 80 million people almost. And that's, that's, a, that's a really stark reality that I, I personally felt like we haven't dealt with as a global community very well. And so I wanted to sort of study how that played out in different regions. And so um, after I'd done the first two films, um, I, I was looking at the, the, how the flow of refugees and economic migrants had shifted from the central Mediterranean, which we covered in my last film, Lifeboat, and how it had shifted eastward across the Red Sea from Djibouti and Ethiopia, um, to the west coast of Yemen and then up to Saudi, the border with Saudi Arabia. And once I started doing that research, um, I just discovered so many things, the complicity of our own government and tax dollars in the conflict there that's happening in the country itself. Um, and then the scale of the displacement of IDPs in the country because of the war is just staggering. And, and it's, it's layered in with a uh, human caused famine that is causing the greatest loss of human life in the world right now uh, in terms of um, pediatric loss. So I was really motivated to sort of pursue it on a deeper level. And um, so I started talking to colleagues, um, mostly journalistic colleagues in this case, who had been able to find a way to get into the country because there's a standing embargo against journalists getting visas to go to the country. So, you know, I communicated with Nick Kristoff and with Giles Clark and a bunch of other New York Times folks who had been able to get into very care get into the country carefully. And they started to put me into contact with Nurse Makia in the north and Dr. Al Sadiq, who runs Sadaka Hospital in the south. And I began a WhatsApp conversation basically with both of them. And it was out of that conversation that I decided that we, I just had, I was being called to do this film. Wow. Um, you know, it's, I was gonna ask you a little bit about the nurse and the doctor, and this seems like an appropriate time. Um, they uh, obviously are dealing with just major, major, major uh, sadness and, and death and, um, and, and seeing these young babies sort of dying before your eyes, uh, you, you know, that's a really difficult uh, job, so to speak, and a difficult, um, you know, for longevity of, are there, are there a lot of other people that are doing this work or, you know, is it, and I, and I also assume access um, 
I assume you, they have to pay for it. The people coming into the hospitals are going to have to pay out of their own pockets. And, and I don't think there's a lot of wealth. So what is the access for the majority of the people and how many people are, you know, how many hospitals exist and, and, and people like uh, the doctor and the nurse doing this work? Yeah, so to put it in a little bit of context, um, already 100,000 people have already died of starvation in the country, of literally not having enough to eat. You know, that's, that's the size of a small city, right? Um, so so that, that's the stark reality that these, these doctors and nurses are working in. Um, and they, the, um, one of the amazing things about both Makia and, and Aida is that, you know, to do their work, it, it takes resources, right? It takes right. resources of time of staff. It takes blood tests. It takes food, obviously, and specialty nutrition pr uh, products because you can't just feed someone who's in, in a deep level of starvation anything because it will be rejected. So you have to phase in certain foodstuffs on different levels. And, and the reality is, is that when someone shows up on their doorstep, they treat them. Even if they have no money, they treat them and they find a way to make it work. So when we were filming with Makia in the North, for example, there's this moment which has stuck with me ever since filming in that facility. And, and there was, you know, there was a, a young girl who came who desperately needed treatment, who was really literally on the brink of death. And um, she arrived with a, a male caregiver. And you know, they don't allow male caregivers to stay in the facility. And this was, you know, maybe a five-year-old child. And, you know, what they're supposed to do is turn the child away until, you know, there's someone who can stay there with them. And what Makia did is she said, stop. She had the dad just wait there for a second. She went into one of the treatment rooms and she convinced one of the other mothers who already had a child there to become the guardian, the temporary guardian of the child until they could get a female family member there to watch her. So that's just one example of how flexible in solving problems Makia and, and, also, and Dr. Asadigar are in, in every respect. They find a way to make it work no matter the barrier. And well, it's inspiring to me. Yeah, and but I mean, there again, logistically, how did you as a male, you know, gain that access and be so closely. I mean, there were parts of the film where you're intimately involved in the mother and the child and the, you know, the, the emotion and, uh, you know, they, it, it seemed like they weren't shunning you. They were actually uh, Im imploring you to tell the story. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fair question. Um, and, and it was one of the, the concerns that, that, that I had going into the project, frankly, was, um, you know, would we be accepted on some level? Um, would we be allowed access to such intimate moments? And um, my approach in, in doing this project and, and other projects similar to this is always, it's, it's, it's founded in trust, right? It's in building trust, in active dialogue in establishing an ongoing conversation with anyone we're filming with so that it, it transforms into a collaboration. So, you know, that started long before we arrived with Dr. Al-Sadiq and with Makia, right? And a, back, a, a really robust back and forth in terms of what they were facing, right? Um, long before we got to what we thought, how we could thought we could collaborate with them because we really wanted to understand what it was like for a doctor and a nurse to work under these extraordinary circumstances. So there was a basis of understanding first, and only then did I try to share how I thought we could fit into that in terms of getting their story out in a way that they really wanted it to get out. Because one of the challenges for them is because they are so resource depleted because of the war, they, they really need people to know um, that they need help, they need resources, they need people to know that this famine, the conditions they're working under is human cost, right? And until, in, until the, the air and land embargo is lifted, they're gonna continue to treat this, this scale of patients um, until others know about it. Now with the families, it was the same trajectory um, in the sense that the first thing we did was just sit down with each family and have a conversation and multiple conversations in many instances and just hear their story 
and share with them why we were there and what we were hoping to do and and uh, a robust back and forth again and you know i didn't know how people would respond to that conversation and we had to be open to people saying no and the reality was was that almost to a t almost every family wanted to collaborate almost every family wanted people to know that they were there because they couldn't feed their child and they couldn't feed and, their child you know, the, there was a, a human caused famine right um, I'm assuming you had, you must have had a team of uh, of Yemen, Yemeni technical people to help you with the translation. Um, I mean that that alone, being able to sit down and gain trust when uh, I don't know, maybe you do. Do you speak Arabic? I don't. I don't speak Arabic. Um, but that was the other relationship which we um, we we had had established and developed over a long period of time. So I, I brought on my, my field producers. We had to have two field producers, Yemeni field producers, one in the South and one in the North because they can't travel back and forth because the country's bifurcated by war. And so um, I brought on those field producers, I think it was six months before we landed in the country to, to start these conversations with them. And then they started the conversations with the families who were coming and going in the hospitals, right? So they had already had these conversations with the families to share the project. And then while we were filming, of course, they were there in real time with us every moment so that, um, so that if there was any questions about any issue at all, we could in, do a real time translation um, to get it answered and to, and to fully understand. Fantastic. And, and, you know, sort of, I know culturally the segregation of male and female is, is important. And so I'm, I, I'm going to pose this in a question a little bit different. Um, was there, were there legal issues besides cultural with you being a male and a female in a pediatric ward with female caretakers? And did you have to overcome hurdles with the government to, to, to get, get that access, number one? And number two, um, you just said that the country's bifurcated because of war. How did you cross back and forth? Uh, you know, to, I'm sure people are very interested in kind of the the danger of of document. Well, documentary filmmaking, I think, has really become the journalism of uh, our current. You know, where all our current news comes from, and so. War correspondents, I think you've all become basically the one you and people that do this similar work. So, can you just comment on on th that for you know? Yeah. Yes. So, so there's there's a lot there to unpack. Um, <laughs> a lot, a lot there to unpack. So, so the first to to your first question in terms of uh, sort of the nature of administrative consent and legal hurdles, um, you know, the the we had visas to film. And um, that was not an easy get. Um, I, I had a conversation with Nick Kristoff the other day about the film because he had he'd done work in the same facility that we filmed in, and it took him two years to get his visa. <laughs> he works for the New York Times, right? So I felt pretty fortunate when I had that conversation with him because we took only us eight and a half months, right? So we had the proper paperwork. So that was the starting point. We had the proper paperwork to be there and to be filming both because it's separate. And then the big get was really um, the conversation with the administration of the hospital um, to have permission and free reign within the hospital from the administrative standpoint to work within that institution. We secured that as well because we started that conversation early. And then within the wards themselves, we just were very, very sensitive to the needs of each family. And that happened on a moment to moment basis. And you know, I always like to say that you know, consent isn't static, it's a dynamic entity that that is a real living thing. And so you have to be sensitive to it. So, you know, if if a family was having a hard day with their child and and we became aware of that, then we just we wouldn't film with them that day. You know, so there was that was a constant back and forth. And we just stayed tuned into it um, on a moment to moment basis. But I mean, still, there must be the honoring of those consents. You had, you know, from the hospital when you're crossing a war, you know, a border or a, a you know, a, just a control point, you, you didn't have, a, did you have trouble, you know, gaining that access and getting yeah. back and forth? And also, logistically, your your accommodations, what, how, how, where did you stay? How did you eat? <laughs> yeah, so, no, no, you're onto some really, some really rich veins here. Um, so, so 
logistically transit in the country was one of the biggest hurdles because it is a conflict zone and because um, there, there are different warlords and militias right. that have control over different areas. So, the, you know, the most dangerous part of our work in many ways was not the risk of being hit by a missile attack in the north. It was anytime we need to transit from one militia held area to another, um, you know, you have to go through a lot of checkpoints. And right. so um, those checkpoints are always the most dangerous moments where there's a good chance you'll be detained. And if you're detained, there's always the chance of kidnapping and ransom. And so um, it was any time we traveled, we had a GPS device in addition to our mobile phones, which was which were you know clean devices that we weren't our personals that we just bought in country. But we I would leave GPS markers anytime we we're in transit that my producer in the U.S. would track, so he knew as we we're in transit, you know, where you were. Yeah, so he knew exactly where we were at any moment. And the one time we were detained. Um, by a warlord uh, and had to sort of talk our way out of it with the help of some phone calls. Um, I was able to mark it because it's a really small GPS device that can fit my sock. And so I literally was marking it as we pulled up and were moved to this warlord's house, basically. And I slipped it in my sock. So if they searched me, hopefully they wouldn't find it. So lots of things like that. And then, and then in terms of our, you know, where we stayed, it was, it, it was a, a broad spectrum. In the north, because the Houthis have control, we stayed at a five-star hotel once. Yeah. It's the only one open in the country. And then, you know, for several nights in the south, we stayed um, with the presidential guard in their army compound, which is a, a former school that's on the front lines, you know, with tracer fire going over all night. So it was everything from sleeping on concrete slabs in old schools to five-star hotels and everything in between. Wow. Amazing. And it sounds like you definitely had um, the ear and the and the permission of of the of the government that because other, you know, otherwise you wouldn't have had any of that. And it sounds like they want this story to to become an international, you know, to, to be recognized internationally and seen. And, and on that, um, what <laughs> I think a lot of people um, aren't really don't know kind of the the full story of what's happening in Yemen, and it would be nice just in this context to give a little historic background um, about how why the country is where it is, and you know sort of the money flowing in from different governments, and um, which is obviously ex exacerbating a situation, and you know really. The, the end result is is this and I think you know sitting in your house in in California looking uh, at the news it just doesn't strike you at, you know it, it's not it doesn't it doesn't resonate um, this film really brings home what happens the end result of where our tax dollars go and and why and if you wouldn't mind spending a few minutes kind of on a historic journey of yeah, and in the in the modern history. Yeah, happy to. You know, this as, as you probably know, this 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 war is often called the the forgotten war, um, uh, and it's you know it's been going on for for over six years now. And so, really, the 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 catalytic catalytic event for the status quo now was when a group called Ansar Allah, also known as the Houthi rebel group, came down from the far north of the country in 2014. And over just the course of a, of a couple of weeks, really took over the capital of Sana, um, which is the traditional capital of the country. And, um, and when that happened, uh, Saudi Arabia to the north, who shares a border with Yemen, um, they, they um, pretty arrogantly thought, well, we don't want a Shiite group, because Saudi Arabia is primarily Sunni. We don't want a Shiite group taking control of the country to our north. And so they put together a, um, a very quick and I think ill-begotten coalition of partners um, to support an air campaign that started bombing the north of the country, the Houthi rebel group, thinking that they would quickly dislodge this little rebel group. Um, and six years later, um, this coalition continues to bomb the north of the country on a daily basis, often 
um, at non-military targets. Um, and dozens and dozens of these, it's actually in the hundreds now, have been well documented as war crimes because they've targeted medical facilities, they've targeted farms, they've targeted MSF facilities three or four different times with big, you know, medical crosses painted on the top. So it was an, it was an, you know, ill-begotten war. Um, and the U.S., when Saudi Arabia came to the Obama administration and said, we're going to do this, we want you to sort of affirm us by joining this coalition, they said yes, we said yes. And so we've been a coalition partner um, to this series of war crimes from the get-go, sadly. And our tax dollars have supported the coalition militarily, as well as sold arms um, to the Saudis um, for all these missile strikes. So, you know, in 2016, there was a missile strike that we show in the film that hit a memorial service that killed over 140 people. And uh, those were Raytheon missiles manufactured in Arizona that were sold to the Saudis that were used in that strike that killed dozens of children. You know, it was a non-military target. So we're complicit in this conflict and have been from the get-go. That said, probably the worst um, piece of the current status quo surrounding the conflict is that there's an air and sea embargo throttling the country, contributing to the famine. So the Saudi coalition, including us, has shut down the Sana'a airport that prevents uh, foodstuffs as well as medicine and medical personnel from flowing freely in and out of the country. And there's a sea embargo closing the major port of Hodeidah almost completely, preventing most diesel from getting in, as well as World Food Program foodstuffs, which goes to the two clinics you see in the film. And so even though the foodstuffs are there on ships offshore, they can't get where they need to go because the Saudis don't allow the ships to, to land. So it's, uh, it's a really horrible situation that can be resolved, but the will hasn't been there up to this point. You know, it's really fascinating when you think about it from the perspective of the resources that are being directed and, and, and groups that would like to uh, come in and bring food and medicine and whatever's needed. Um, it seems like a lot of that funding comes from the countries that are supporting Saudi Arabia um, in, the, in the embargo. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of irony involved here, isn't there? You know, yes. um, you know, we sell we sell missiles to Saudi Arabia, right? Who then um, shoots them into buildings, civilian buildings in um, in Sana that I I've, I've been in, and I've talked to the civilian victims of those, and then we we pay you know for foodstuffs to be delivered through USAID um, for the very people who are being bombed by our missiles. You know, I had a conversation with um, David Beasley today, the, the executive director of the World Food Program, and he was in Yemen just two weeks ago. And, um, you know, he, he feels the same way, in fact. He, he feels like the only thing that is going to resolve the famine that's killing so many children unnecessarily is an end to the war. And that's going to take pressure on U.S. senators and U.S. representatives to end it because we actually have agency as as a um, as a demographic here in the U.S. to place enough pressure through the Biden administration on Saudi Arabia to to stop the blockade, and if if we're successful in that effort, then um, children will stop dying from famine. Yeah, we'll stop. You know, I I you know in your work on dis displacement, uh, with your with your other films and whatnot, where it's a lot of it is climate, and 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 government, you know, war. This is this is almost war, the worst scenario um, because it's uh, just a, a, a complete the, the entire population. There's it's it's um, it's it's almost a catch twenty two. You know, there doesn't seem like there, except for the what you're you're mentioning. That's sort of the only route. And what is your plan? What with this film? Um, you know, I've I've worked on a couple films. Uh, one on you know chasing ice, which was a, uh, obviously the melting ice, and my friends Jahan and Kareem Amir, Jahan Nujam, on the invisible. No, sorry, sorry, um, the square uh, in Egypt, and you know they did a, a, an amazing outreach uh, with senators and and House members um, to really educate them. Do you have a plan? I mean, obviously, right now you're facing the Oscars. You want to first? Let's talk about something good. Let's talk about the Oscars. Um, 
uh, tell us who what what films you're up against, and uh, and also you know a little bit about what it felt like to be nominated again. Yeah, um, you know we're we're up against some great films, and um, you know I I I often like to when this question comes up, I like to duck it a little bit. <laughs> um, and, and I'll just I'll just um, share with you my favorite quote about this. And that's that's the quote that Roosevelt made so many years ago that, you know, comparison is the thief of joy, right? And so I, I, I try not to, True. I try not to go there if I can. And, and I think it's healthier just to focus on, um, uh, you know, what we can do with our own film, right? So it's incredibly gratifying to be recognized by colleagues to, to receive the nomination. And I will forever be thankful and proud of that. And yet, really what we're focused on is what what you brought up which is that we are this film from the get-go from from conceptualization forward has the intent has been to shine a light and it for it to be a vehicle for change right to use it actively and utilize it actively to to um mechanize change um, in terms of specifically u.s policy um uh, with the with the coalition, and so what we're doing is we've partnered with um, around 200 different civil society groups um, in the U.S. And, and the diaspora to really apply pressure um, to uh, the Biden administration senators and representatives to try to convince our government to change policy. And I don't know if you followed it, but you know Biden's first um, uh, press conference. Um, he spoke about Yemen and he he said we are publicly changing our stance and we're going to stop supporting any offensive operations um, in Yemen. Um, and so our push now really is to clarify what that means exactly because bombing raids have continued since that statement and also um, to to make sure that the US applies the right pressure on Saudi Arabia to end the blockade because the blockade is the most damaging aspect of the war right now on the civilian population because it does prevent foodstuffs and diesel from easily entering the country. So, so we're doing a lot of policy screenings. We did a screening with the World Food Program, the Oslo Peace Center today. We're doing one with the United States Institute of Peace on Monday to sort of like uh, bring in policymakers and decision makers. Um, we're doing a lot of policy work and then just trying to get the word out as, as far and wide as we can. And, and do you have funding or are these organizations all donating their time and, and you know, hiring lobbyists is quite, uh, quite expensive and, um, you know, you know, the, the, the bulk of our partners, it's, it's, it's pro bono, right? This is a civil society yeah. movement that that's doing it because it's the right thing to do right what a great thing to hear in this day and age right yeah yeah absolutely and, and you know that that just keeps me, that gets me up every morning you know sir because it's like you know um they they're doing it because they know the war um you know i think when we look back on this 20 30 40 50 years from now this is a stain it's going to be a stain on the global community frankly that we didn't do more that we didn't act you know, more aggressively, more quickly to end uh, something that can be ended through human action. And right. so we're incredibly proud to be a part of the movement and it's truly a movement. Um, and I, I think it's, it's only gaining momentum now. And I don't think it's going to stop until uh, so the US has changed its stance in a fundamental and concrete way. Well, you know, one of the ways I think uh, a film, you know, you, you ducked the quest or the answer a little bit about the, the Academy Awards and or the Oscars and and who you're up against, but you know, people like myself and Mira and people who are involved with the Academy. Um, I think I personally, and this is I, I don't represent the Academy or anything like that, but I think that it's time for us to start recognizing films because when they're when they win, that's when everybody watches them, and that's what makes a difference. And you know, those are that's the, the the little thing we can do as a population in this community because most likely the people who are going to see this are uh, filmmakers and and people who are interested in film and involved with the academy and and you know really putting pressure on on um, uh, on the documentary film side about social issue uh, issue 
these documentaries and the impact they can have worldwide. And I think we kind of lose sight of what film can do for the world. Yeah. And, and um, you know, it's it just seems to me it's time, you know, it, it, for especially a story like this, which I just, you know, commend, I, I, I'm just blown over by your willingness to do this and the risks you took um, and just the incredible horror of, of this whole scenario. Um, and, you know, it's not the only, it's one of the worst in the world, but there are a lot of other hotspots in the world where children are, are suffering and, and being abused and, and filmmakers and documentary filmmakers are really, you know, the ones taking up the reins to, to expose these, these atrocities. So I really um, just want to thank you for, for this. Um, is there, you know, anything that you think I've missed as a, as that you want to, you know, sort of message you want to get out about the film and, um, you know. Yeah, you, you've sparked a lot of things in my head here, Sarah. So, um, I, but, but, you know, I, I guess I just wanted to sort of affirm something that you just threw out there. And that's that I, I really do, you know, personally, I'm a big fan of investigate, good investigative journalism. And, you know, with the sort of, fourth estate being on the wane um, the last several decades in terms of funding and being right. taken over by different forms of media, you know, the funding of investigative, good investigative journalism has really diminished. And, and we know how that story played out in so many ways. And I think you're right. I think part of what documentary can do and maybe should do is fill up some of that space within the fourth estate um, because it needs, it needs, it needs to happen. Right. And, and, and I think, we fill a really interesting space within the fourth estate as filmmakers rather than print journalists or rather than you know still photographers or writers because of the nature of cinema itself you know because because cinema can touch people in such a unique way you know i always think of it as as the confluence of arts right, right. because it brings together so many beautiful arts into a single medium that it has um uh I think it sort of has a, a particular power that that any standalone art maybe doesn't have in, uh, in its own way. So so I think I think personally, um, as a filmmaker, you know, what better use of my time on this planet than to do a film about something that can intervene, to do right. a film to use the power of cinema to intervene in a real world tragedy that we have agency over. If, if people only know about it and are willing to engage. So that's, you know, that's the thesis for the film right there, right? Is that we're trying to get people to watch so they'll engage because we can solve this one. Yeah, well said, we can. And I hope we do. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 another thing that sort of occurred to me while you were talking is the audience has changed too for uh, journalism and news and uh, young people coming up now who they get their news through visual art, through the visual arts. They don't necessarily go to a newspaper or a magazine. And it's because they're more sophisticated in, as you said, it's a much more powerful way to, to get your message across. And, you know, it, it touches all aspects of, I, I, I actually was involved at one point with a, with a film group in, at UCLA and, you know, there was a program there to basically educate all college students instead of creative in liberal arts, instead of creative writing, cre uh, filmmaking, because you're you're not only engaging and you have to write it, but you have to then, uh, you know, learn all the other aspects around um, the, the presentation of the story. And it's yeah. much deeper. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, yeah. But yeah. I do think I have I have twins who are 28, almost 29, and um, they all their information that they get is is through documentary film, pretty much. And you know, I don't I don't think that trend is necessarily going to reverse itself. No. Right? No. I, think, I think it's the way of the future, and right. um, you know, I think it's one of the ways. It's one of the it's one of the reasons, other than just sheer logistics and having a nimble paradigm for this trilogy, that I wanted to do a, a trilogy of shorts, frankly, because I think. Um, you know, a short is a different medium than a feature. It just right. is, right? And you tell the story in a different way. It's almost a shorthand, right? 
And so I, I think it feeds into the strength of cinema right. to do it for if you do well, it visually. And I, I sit on a college board and I have for 21 years and the, the college kids learn differently now. They, they don't have the, the attention span because they're, they're so used to getting so much information so quickly at a young age. And it's, it's gone from like 20 minutes down to, I hate to say it, two or three, you know, that you have to get a message across in a college setting. And so, um, yeah, and this is the, this again is the perfect uh, medium. And I do think shorts are the, you know, are the, are the way of the future. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. So. So too. Wow. It's great, great <laughs> to talk to you. This is really rich. Yeah. Any questions you want to ask me? <laughs> uh, no, I think you covered, I think you covered um, the, the, the bulk of them. Although, you know, um, you know, we ought to collaborate, I guess is what yeah. I would say. There you go. I, I've, I've, I've followed your work for, for many years. And so I would love to, um, to talk yeah. down the road. Absolutely. I mean, that's my, that's actually how I got involved in, in uh, documentary film was uh, I was doing sort of edu uh, actually conservation activism and lobbying in Washington, clean air and water and and also educational and gender activism. And I went on a retreat with a group of yoga, uh, sorry, yoga retreat with a group of documentary filmmakers. And I sat around and I was like, wow, this is like, you know, a hundred times more powerful, uh, you know, than what I'm doing in my little way. And you can reach so many more people. So, and, and that's what I'm attracted to is stories that are, you know, need to be told and people need to be educated on, on things. So anyway, this was, this was eye opening. I actually spent, I did a film in Ethiopia and I was right across the border from Yemen. And I met a guy there who was traveling, but with a backpack and he was heading into Yemen. I'm not sure what his role was, but this is about seven years ago. And I, uh, you know, from the U S and, uh, you know, I, I, uh, was have been very curious about uh, what's been going on there since. So thank you for, for educating me. Yeah, it's, it's my pleasure. I think we all educate each other, right? Um, with each project. And so, uh, you know, we learn from each other. We, right. we, we gain knowledge and understanding from each other. And I think that's the, that's the beauty of the arts, isn't it? Right, right. What's your next project? Or is this, I, is this I, gonna be a long-term? I don't know. <laughs> You know, Sarah, I started this as a trilogy and, and somehow we successfully got to the end of the trilogy. Well, almost, you know, we want to get this governmental yeah. change done first. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I really don't know. I've been so focused on this. You know, I, I make my living primarily as a DP. And so these films have been happening in between sort of my, my, my right. DP work. So um, I, think, I think once we're past the Oscars, um, and and we've convinced the U.S. government to change their stance. Then then um, I'll sort of throw my focus to what the next project is, and I frankly don't know what it is at this point from a filmic standpoint. Having worked with a lot of climate scientists at, at uh, Lamont Doherty at Columbia, um, we're going to have a lot more displacement. You know. Yeah. No, it's already happening, right? Yeah. And and it's going to be on our doorstep. So. Yep. Anyway, thank you, um, Mira. Are you still with us? No, okay. So I guess, thank you all for, for putting your eyes on this and listening to us. And I, I hope you uh, take my suggestion and, and reach out to your friends in the Academy and really get their attention on this film and the importance of it. So, Sarah, it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you yeah. and have this conversation. It, yeah. it, it, uh, I look forward to more interaction. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Take care.